out the summertime. Hello, everybody. Kevin Chris here. Our weekly seminar on July 15th. We've got David Gast. We've got Captain Jody Gay. Captain Mark Harrison. So, you guys, take it away. All right, well, back to where we started. Um, shrimp baiting is probably new to a lot of you. Um, it's something that's been going on in South Carolina. Um, for quite some time. In the mid-1980s, two guys moved up from Florida and they were just doing really, really real, well with the shrimp. Um, and as secrets are with any kind of recreational sport, they don't last long. You know, they get out, somebody figures it out. These guys were using dog food. They were grinding dog food, putting it in pantyhose, and putting the pantyhose out with bamboo or PVC to mark the locations that they were shrimping. And they were coming back and throwing cast nets over the, uh, the dog food. Well, they were catching hundreds of pounds of shrimp, um, got really, really popular. They figured that if they could attract X number of shrimp with a 21% protein rate, that something would probably be better. And, and then along came the idea of using fish meal, which is basically a, a menhaden byproduct. And it's about 60% protein. So this caught on like wildfire in the mid-1980s. Uh, and it got so popular uh, that the state of South Carolina decided they would outlaw it because the trawlers were complaining that they weren't getting any tax money off of it. And you know how, how government is when they're not getting a piece of the action, they want to shut it down. Well, they had a group of guys go to Columbia and, you know, complain about it and, you know, make a case for it being a recreational season. And that's when the 60-day season started in South Carolina. So even today, you buy a $25 permit, um, you get tags, 10 tags, you get a, a license, and the 10 tags are, are for marking your poles. And um, we'll, we'll move into that just a, li a little bit in a second. Um, basically, basically, the equipment you need is really simple. You need a good cast net. Um, you need some bait. I'm not going to sit here and say that my product is any better than if you mix fish meal with clay or you mix fish meal with mud. Fish meal's fish meal. It stinks to high heaven. You can't make it any more productive than it is. Uh, the only thing that makes my product a little bit better is that it's clean, it's easy to mix, and um, it's really, really efficient. Um, so you need bait, you need a good cast net, um, you need a good mate with you that can steer or one that can throw the cast net. That's really important. And in my opinion, the person driving the boat is just about as important as the person casting the net. Any of y'all have tried to maneuver in the current and try and keep the boat in a certain position, you know how difficult that can be. Um, and in South Carolina, you need a license. And obviously, here you, you don't because there's no season. And we will get into that a little bit more in a second. Um, cast nets. I think some of the big questions we got are regarding cast nets. You know, what's the right size? What type do I use? How much weight? Um, in my opinion, the best cast net for you to throw is the one that you can throw. Um, a lot of people, you know, guys especially, oh, I'm going to get me an 8-footer or a 10-footer. And they get out there and, and it, it's a banana cast every time. Um, that's not going to do you any good. And plus, it's going to about half, half key unless you're in really good shape. Um, I throw an 8-foot net. It's a Betts Super Pro. Um, last year, Mr. Betts was here, so I couldn't talk about other brands. But uh, Black Pearl makes a great net. Caluso makes a great net. Uh, there's a gentleman named Tim Wade who you can go to his website online and he'll custom make you a net. And, you know, you tell Tim how tall you are, what your arm span is, what your weight is, uh, whether or not, you know, you consider yourself to be fairly strong or what have you, and he'll make one that, that suits your body size and, and throwing style the best. And most of the people that I've talked to that have had Tim make them a net are really, really happy with them. So they're, they're worth the money. Um, all right, what I want to do real quick is give you a demonstration of how this stuff works. And before you leave, I've got about 20 samples. I think there's more than 20 people in here now, which is great. But I've got samples for people while they last or anybody that wants to take them home. Um, let's do this demonstration real quick before we move forward and how we get the set up. Um, these come in 5 and 12 pound containers. And again, I'm going to apologize in advance for the smell. It's the only time of the year my wife's okay with me being outside for extended periods of time. A <laughs> um, couple of tips with this. Don't 
pour out the entire container because I don't know if you ever made pancakes and you pour all the batter out and you add too much water and you end up with runny pancakes. That's basically the same situation you run into here. Um, so really all you got to do, and this is going to be a little bit difficult without being hold it. Take your fingers and slowly churn this together. A lot easier if you're sitting down in the boat and you've got your feet on either side of it to keep it in place, but we'll make it work. Anybody smell it? No, good, huh? I always tell my uncle he complains about it. I said, it smells like money you need to be. <laughs> okay, anyway, that's about what we want. And what you want to do is you want to stir this stuff until you get it kind of evenly spread, a good even moisture throughout it and that's kind of what you're looking for. Now for years in South Carolina guys were going out into the creeks they'd get pluff mud, um, pulling pluff mud into their boat, pulling out a 50 pound bag of fish meal and mixing this stuff, fish meal, with pluff mud in the bow of their boat. And you know what kind of mess that's going to make. Um, then they started with Caratex clay, a little bit cleaner but still really really messy. Um, with this stuff, this is really all you do. Um, once you once you get to the boat landing, you got one person in the front of the boat making out these patties, and this is about the right size. Again, a lot of people think the bigger the better, but if you take two of these and you put them out in the water in a place where you've got shrimp already, those shrimp are going to pile up on this bait, and then all you've got to do is come back and make a good accurate throw with the cast net, and you and you load up. And one thing I like to do with these is after I get them patted out, I like to take a little bit of water, and we call this glazing your balls. <laughs> and we've had some real good fun with that topic on the, on the blog sites. Um, and that's what you end up with. And that just gives this an extra good coating. Um, you know, other uses aside from shrimp, uh, I had some guys in Beaufort tell me that they were having great success with it this year, um, chumming for... Um, Chumming for cobia. Um, a lot of the king mackerel guys will will use these in, in, in chum socks to let out a good you know chum slick. Nice thing about it, uh, you know, with menhaden oil, you you got a surface slick. Uh, with this, you're going to have a, a slick that works the whole water column. It's not just going to be on the top, so that's a good advantage. And plus, the particles give you a lot of good benefits with small fish coming in to eat as well. Um, and a crab trap is phenomenal. Um, a little piece of this in a minnow trap is, is great. Um, the guy that caught the state record hogfish in South Carolina was using this somehow, although he wouldn't tell me the exact way he was using it because he was worried that it was going to violate his IFA record. Um, anything I'm leaving out? Catfish. Yeah, uh, catfish. Yeah, you can imagine with the way this smells. Catfish you go bonkers for it. A little, little piece of pantyhose with this in it and um, catfish go crazy. So that's how easy it is to mix. And if I, I wish I had a way to show you how messy the other methods are. Let me see if I can find my rag. All right, so anyway, what, what we do in South Carolina is just going to kind of be a foundation for what you could do here. Because like I say, in South Carolina, you're limited to a 60-day season. Um, and some of you may eventually go to South Carolina and try this. So I'm going to go ahead and start from, from that end. Um, you're limited to a 60-day season. It's usually the first Friday or the last Friday before the 15th of September, and then you've got 60 days, and you can keep 48 quarts a day. Um, here, you're, you've got places that are off limits that you can't keep 48 quarts, and I'm not even going to begin to say that I understand those areas or where they are. Um, that's something you need to check with the DNR site on, on a regular basis with. But in South Carolina... <coughs> What we'll typically do is we like to target um, a tide that's going to be turning from low tide coming in. In my opinion, that's the most productive. So I like to go and get my poles set up and my poles baited right before the tide hits dead low and it's getting ready to turn and start coming in. Um, where you set them up, it's, it's really going to be based on where the shrimp are. 
There's places in South Carolina that everybody knows about. You know the shrimp are going to be there. You don't have to second guess it. Now, I have been on the intercoastal here quite a bit, and I know some of these bays that are on the northern end of the intercoastal, in September and October, I've just taken the boat in there, and I see shrimp flying all over the place. Now, whether or not those spots are open to shrimp, and that's going to be the thing you need to check with the DNR people. But, um, the guys in Georgetown, their favorite method is to, to pull up the, the motor, their outboard motor, and ride along with shallow water and gun it every once in a while, shoot up a rooster tail, and if they see shrimp flying in the rooster tail, that's where they, they put their balls. Good old redneck method. Um, but here, here's, a, here's, a good, here's a good demo of what, what we do. You've got the shoreline here. You want to fish, you know, you want to shrimp with your poles about 5 to 20 feet off of the low tide mark where you know the tide, you know, where you're going to have mud. Fish about, you know, 5 to 20 foot off that low tide mark. Now, these poles basically serve as a reference point for your bait. They tell you where your bait's going to be. Um, so what we'll do, let's say, for example, the tide has turned and the current's coming in, and it's coming in this direction. I want my poles in a perfect line with this current because everybody knows that it's easier to steer and maintain a boat going into the current. We'll come back through with our bait balls, and like I say, I only use two about that size. I call them hockey puck size. And we'll put two bait balls out perpendicularly from these poles. And once we get to this last pole, we'll kick back and wait about 15, 20 minutes and let them soak and um, let it start dispersing. Um, and again, you don't want these balls to be right on top of the pole because what you want to do is you want to be able to get a good open cast. And if they were at the bottom of the poles, you would be throwing them in the pole and that wouldn't, that wouldn't work out too well for you. So I like them about five to six foot off. And what you'll do is you'll have a guy, like I said before, you'll have a guy driving the boat, and he's about as per important as the person casting the net. And he'll ease you up real slowly, and when you make that cast, he'll pop it in neutral, and you'll pull it in, get your shrimp out of it, and as, he, as you get the shrimp out, he's easing you up to this next spot, and you go through this one by one until you reach the last pole, and you turn around and you start the whole process over. There are guys who like to brag, um, you know, whether or not they're telling the truth, I don't know, but there's guys who've said that they, they've got a 48-port cooler doing this in two trips. 20, 20 casts. I've never seen it, so I'd have to see it to believe it. It's kind of like a ghost. But, you know, for, for, from, in my experience, 50 to 60 passes, if the shrimp are running good, you can limit out and get a cooler's worth. But you may have to work harder sometimes. Um, this is how we do it in South Carolina. Um, there's a guy that I know that only puts out one pole, and he baits on either side of it, and he anchors off, and he, he does it by himself. Um, I've got a buddy who will take his boat, and he'll throw out an anchor line out the back, and he'll use his trolling motor to maneuver around <coughs> in a circle, and he's got his poles set around the the circumference of that circle and the bait off of them, and he's able to do this method by himself. He uses that trolling motor and the, the tension in this anchor rope to go in a, in a circle. And he, he does it like clockwork. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways to set this up. The, 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 prim, the primary, the prim, the basis behind the whole thing is being able to identify with either a pole or a piece of bamboo whatever you choose, where your bait is, uh, keeping your bait in the location in front of these poles, and, and, and having a net that you can throw. And uh, when you get into an area that's got shrimp, and you put this fish meal down in front of them, it's, it's pretty exciting what you, what you get into. Now, is it cheaper than going to the seafood market? I won't, I won't get into that conversation. <laughs> but d does anybody have any questions? How long will the bait last out in the water? Um, I've had it last 36 hours in a crab trap, um, so we have we've just about told all of our customers to don't worry about rebaiting. Um, if you get into the habit of rebaiting, that bait's going to be there the next day. You're going to be feeding shrimp and crabs and wildlife all night long. So be confident that uh, two of these per spot is going to be sufficient. How big is the water? 
There are people in South Carolina that have started doing a process called depoling. And they've gotten so good with their, with their depth finders and their charts that they are able to tell the difference between a school of shrimp and a school of menhaden. And, and I've not done it, but my thing with the depth finders, I, I, I seem to spend more time looking at it like, t like it's a TV than I do fishing. Um, so I try to stay away from depth finders unless I've got to have them. But these guys can read a depth finder, know that it's a school of shrimp in 25 foot of water, throw the net, and, and catch a pound or two pounds of shrimp. But typically with the baiting method, you're anywhere from two feet to, to eight, somewhere in that range. And to me, the shallower it is, the easier it is to find them. Um, you've got to get really good and get some experience. Now, one thing I was mentioning to a couple of guys a minute ago was, and, and some of you may have seen this, people will take duct tape. And they'll put a strip of duct tape about one inch, inch and a half from the bottom line of this cast net. And they'll do this around the entire perimeter, I keep saying perimeter, but the entire circumference of this net. Just one piece of duct tape the whole way around. Then they'll take it and they'll flip it over and they'll do the same thing on the back side. And that duct tape sticks to itself and what happens when you throw that cast net with that duct tape on it is it acts like a sail. And this is especially good for catching menhaden or catching shrimp in water deeper than three or four feet, um, you know, or deep holding like I was talking about, because it literally, even on a bad cast, will make this net fan out to where you get the maximum uh, diameter out of your cast. Mm -hmm. Pretty, yeah, pretty good trick. actually making the yeah. webbing now. Mm -hmm. you got we'll sell a few of here. It's, um, it's a pretty neat trick, it really is. Makes us um, bad casters look pretty good. But did, did everybody everybody understand what I was getting at with the size of the net? You know, it, it's you really are inclined to go buy a big net, but if you only get it to open 20% of the time, you're better off getting a five or six footer that you can get to open 70% of the time. You got to be really good to hit it every time. But you, it's 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 a, you know it, it gets tiring. It gets tiring if you throw in a net 30 or 40 times trying to catch mullet or bait fish, and you know how frustrating that can be, just the aggravation of having a net that you can't throw well just makes it even worse. Anything else you can think of? Does it work in the daytime? Yes, it works in the daytime. The bit, are you using the same bit for yeah. the shrimp go deeper? The, the shrimp in the daytime are typically a little bit deeper. And a lot of people swear by going at night. Um, I don't recommend going out and trying this at night the first time you go. Um, as, as y'all know, nighttime fishing can be a little dangerous. Um, I, I have one of one of my competitors in this business was out shrimping with his nephew um, one of the last nights of the season in November, and they hit a channel marker, and um, he got killed. So. And he knew his way around the water. So, uh, one of those situations where I'd be careful. I'd, I'd, I'd learn how to do this in the day. So, I didn't understand on the hockey puck. So it, 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 you're just dropping these in the water, or yeah. you're actually putting them in hose, or no, no. This, this right here is has got a little teeny bit of sand in it. So it's going to sink to it's the bottom. It's going to sink pretty quick. Okay. Now in high current areas, you may need to try and gauge where you drop it because it may move with the current mm -hmm. before it settles. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's just hit or miss. But this this will go straight to the bottom, and obviously I make them that shape because they tend to hug a lot better than if they were. And they smell good. <laughs> Any other questions? We had talked about doing a, a cast, net, cast net demo, um, but I might catch a bunch of dogs. If we did that, so might have to let that go towards the end of the other, yeah. other seminar. Anything else y'all want to y'all think of? It, it's it's catching on. I mean, I look at your your, your rack in there. There's, there's people buying it. We're starting to sell it now. Um, and I'm seeing people come back. You, know, you can sell anybody anything one time. But to sell it more than once, have them come back day, you know, day after day and buy the same thing over again, you know, that's telling me that it does work here. Yeah, yeah I bought some of it last year, first time. I didn't have enough sense to know the pole thing and all that, so I was just kind of putting it out blindly, throwing off the end of my dock. 
yeah. kind of doing it there, but it worked. It worked yeah. fine. Yeah, off the end of the dock's pretty, pretty, a pretty good spot. You know, and I think you've got some guys that are doing it off the sea walls and near the boat landings and mm -hmm. you know, places like that. You probably don't need a reference marker, but you get out there in open water in one of these bays, you know, you, you, um, you'd be good to have a piece of bamboo or, or a pole, and and start off with one or two poles. Don't feel like you got to go, you know, high tech with ten or whatever, because that's that's a that's a lot of management right there. Until you do a 10, you don't really fully appreciate what kind of work it is. Start with a couple. Um, you know, work with it, ex you know, experiment with it, and, and I promise you, you, you'll, you will catch the shrimp if they're there. And pin fish, too. And pin fish, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Another thing, too, some of these fishermen use them so they can get the shrimp every morning. They trout fishing. Or, yeah. You know, something like that. The shrimp be there every morning before you get ready to go. You want to keep them alive. That's right. Be, be a, a, a lot quicker way to get them, and if you got a, a shrimp cage, you keep them alive. Mm -hmm. right um, I got, I got, I think I got 20 samples in there, so y'all can <laughs> duke it out with whatever method you want to go for. Um, Chris, if you would pick a number from 1 to 24 for me, please. 18. Who's got number 18 on the top left corner there? Yeah. All right. This is yours. I'm going to have to fight over a little bag. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him get a little bag. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll pass these around. I've been trying to find it for 10 years. Have you? <laughs> we had it here. When did we put it in? Two years ago or was it just last year? I think it was two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. That's that basket around there for me. And I'm going to start cleaning up because I know we got other people coming in. Um, this is a good friend of mine, Bonzo. He's got about a pound by the tentacles in each hand. He's a big supporter of mine. I wish the picture was a little bit lighter so you can see it better. This was, um, this was me out in Bulls Bay about seven years ago. It's one of my favorite pictures. This is a regular Rubbermaid lid. Um, so you can see they got Bonzo, he'll, he'll fill up a, this looks like a Folgers can. He'll fill that up with bait miner, and this is how many balls he'll make out of that one fold. So uh, make make it last. It's, it's really potent. And this is always a cool picture to see with the, with the kids out here doing it. Now, anybody want this patty I made here? You got any bread? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I got these, a grill outside. These are real good if you blacken them. <laughs> yeah. One of the last in the long of it. <laughs> they, they might. If anybody wants that, they're welcome to it. <laughs> but I, I appreciate y'all coming. We were thinking we might, we well, were going to have about four or five people there for a minute, and then all of a sudden everybody came. And we, dogs like it, so keep away. Yeah, that's one thing I probably should mention. Uh, black labs, especially, are very fond of these patties. That's one of the advantages to, to making them on the boat and only making the number you need because the guys have typically in the past make 50 or 60 of them and go and not use them all and bring them home. Um, don't do that because labs love to eat them. I, I get a call every year. My lab has eaten four or five of these patties and hadn't gone to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Will you tell me what's in it? And I say, no, I can't do that. But uh, I can promise you it's safe. If you want to take a bite of it, you can. <laughs> All things shall pass. Yeah. In time. Huh? They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't put that name binder in there. The dog. <laughs> so, somebody was saying feed the dog the blueberries. Blueberries? Everybody's looking. October and the moon is coming. The clouds won't give up the ghost.